I'm Dr. Lisa Herring, sole finalist for the position of superintendent for the Atlanta Public School System. It is my honor to connect with you virtually during what we all know is one of the most unique and unusual times. It is first of all my hope that you are well. It is second my intention to hope to be able to communicate with you so that you could learn not only a little bit more about me, but that I can engage and entertain questions that you have. I want to reassure you that I am absolutely excited to be able to transition into this position. I hope that you will learn that what you'll gain from me is a passionate professional who is committed to education for all children. And in that passion and in that profession, it is my privilege to serve you well. And service is a part of how I lead. At this time, I look forward to entertaining questions. And most importantly, I look forward to the opportunity that will come to meet many of you across the city of Atlanta. What experience have you had in the classroom? Well, as an experienced educator, I have been very fortunate that my full career in education has started, like many, uh, outside of being a student in the classroom. My first year of teaching occurred right after graduation from Spelman College at a private school in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Winchester Thurston School, where I taught uh, creative writing and elementary. Uh, after that, I had the opportunity to return to my hometown of Macon, Georgia, where I served at McAvoy Middle School in Macon as an eighth grade language arts teacher. What other experiences have you had with students? In addition to my time in the classroom, I had the good fortune to serve as a middle school counselor for a little over five years in DeKalb County Schools at Cedar Grove Middle School. We actually, in 1999, opened up that middle school uh, for the first time as Georgia's first environmental theme school. For five plus years as a middle school counselor, I worked with sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, of course. In addition to that, one of our areas of focus was on reading. And so a part of the, a, a part of the school's work was that everyone served as a reading interventionist. And I had the good fortune to do that as well with all of the scholars at Cedar Grove Middle during that time. So then there's a combination of both having the opportunity to serve as a classroom teacher, but also pushing in at the next level to be a school counselor middle school. Can you share more about how you helped advance other school districts? As a sitting superintendent, one of our greatest victories in Birmingham, Alabama, has been the opportunity to move the academic needle. I arrived at a time where the school district's overall report card, as reported by the Alabama State Department of Education, was underperforming at a 66. And then we've since moved that to a 71C. That is critically important. But it's also necessary to note that a C is not intended for complacency. But we did celebrate that the progress had been made. How did we do that? We focused on instructional leadership. Instructional leadership not only from the school level with the principal leader, but being more intentional and strategic in pushing into the classroom to support our teacher leaders, to ensure that the right curriculum framework was in place, to ensure that there was standards-driven instruction. Most importantly, to ensure that teachers felt supported in both formal and informal observations, but not to penalty. And so what we've seen is a dramatic increase. And what they've established is a blueprint to create and to continue that trajectory. It's also important to note that for seven years in Charleston, South Carolina, I served in several capacities, leading at leaving as the deputy superintendent for academics. But while there, we had another academic milestone with the state report card. For the first time in its history, Charleston, during my time there as an academic officer, moved to the highest rated report card that the state can give, a report card grade of excellent. And that's also important. Here again, similar strategies, but not identical. Focusing on early literacy was paramount. Looking at, at grade equity or inequities, as well as, as well as providing the appropriate academic and behavioral interventions throughout the district. And so in both of those instances, being able to move a school system is the critical part of the work. And I've been fortunate to lead that. You seem to have worked well with the Birmingham mayor, so will you do the same in Atlanta? It is indeed a fact that I had the good fortune to not only work well with Mayor Randall Woodfin, but to build a partnership and a friend. I am also then excited to do the same with Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms here in Atlanta. I've had the good fortune to talk to Mayor Bottoms, and I am excited about not only our conversation, but what lies ahead in partnership and collaboration 
to champion the Atlanta public school system as well as the city of Atlanta at large. What specific steps will you take to support distance learning for students and faculty? It is without question that we're all concerned around the future as it relates to COVID-19, not just the learning component, but the well-being component. I'm transitioning from a district where we had what we called an academic continuity plan that addresses remote learning as well as traditional instructional packets. I want to celebrate the work that's already been done by many of the teacher leaders and staff and administration in Atlanta Public Schools. It's important that as that continues to unfold day by day, that is not only supported, but as I transition in, that I provide the support and the reflection on where we see things that are going well and where we see challenges. The other reality, though, is that with virtual learning or e-learning or remote learning, it lifts many inequities, not just for Atlanta Public Schools, but for schools across the country. For as much as the school board has put in place an equity plan, and an equity policy, I should say, it's critically important that we put a laser focus on where those inequities lie as it relates to device access as well as Wi-Fi. I champion all of those who've been in the front line of supporting. As I come in, it's important to me to continue to assess what's needed from the learning standpoint of resources and also from the well-being standpoint of teachers and students. How will you address a potential financial loss in state funding? How will you address parent support changes due to job loss? So as a sitting superintendent, it's critically important to acknowledge the possibility or the potential of funding being impacted by COVID-19. In transitioning into the system, I think it's important to spend critical time, not just with the board, but also with the CFO, and also with school leaders to examine and take inventory of potential impact and planning. And for as much as Atlanta Public Schools has already started the strategic thought around what could be, I will embrace and entertain that as well. The question regarding families and job loss and potential impact on economy in the household is an important one. Part of what the school system has always been able to historically do, school systems across the country, is to provide support and resources where available, family engagement, for example, but also pushing in from a social emotional well-being component to know what needs are and to be able to advocate for other resources so that we can ensure just as much as the child is well, that where we can provide support for families, we can entertain that. And that may be in partnership with other entities across Atlanta. But I do think it's an important item to be on the radar throughout this transition. How do you propose accelerating the success of some schools while also lifting up underperforming schools? I think as a sitting superintendent and as an experienced educator, that's been a part of my work. Being able to identify the inequities that we see in both higher performing schools in contrast and comparison to lower performing. The goal is that all of our schools are high performing. The reality is that we must look at the difference between poverty and privilege, the difference between the haves and the have nots, but not necessarily around socioeconomic status alone, but pushing into resources that are available in schools, looking at research-based, evidence-based, best practices, but looking at all of that through the lens of equity. I've had a chance to examine and do that in other places, and I am excited about the opportunity to be able to lead that same type of work in Atlanta Public Schools so that we lift all of our schools to the area and level of success that every student deserves. How do you plan to work with the Equity Task Force? I celebrate and applaud the fact that there is already an existing equity task force in Atlanta Public Schools. I'm encouraged and ready to meet with the task force. In past roles, I've also been able to work with similar task force, such as a diversity task force in South Carolina. What I am focusing on at this juncture is the fact that the board has put in place an equity policy, and now we roll up our sleeves as a task force and come together to determine what are the steps that actually execute the work, building the blueprint, being responsible, and understanding that, as I've said earlier, the pandemic has put in front of us more inequities than ever. The task force will help lead some of that focus. And together, I'm excited about the future of schools and the future for the community 
by the work of the task force, but then, of course, by the work of the foot soldiers in the classrooms and in our schools and in our community. What major changes, short and long term, do you plan to implement to improve APS? So I want to be very intentional around the focus of major changes, short and long term, upon arrival. The biggest change will be the role of the superintendent. And so because leadership is changing, I think it's incredibly important to pause and pay attention to what exists as challenges and victories, and to be able to meet with staff to understand the changes that have already been put in place and the future vision around where that might go. It is not my goal to come in and disrupt, but to come in and help support. So the first goal would be to pay attention, to listen, to take inventory, and then collectively recommend changes and goals, long or short term. But to do that carefully, because we're transitioning in a very unique time, and I think sustainability and support is a critical part of the first arrival. What is your position and plan to address charter schools? So I recognize that I'm coming into a district where our charter schools already exist. What I appreciate championing is innovation. And innovation in and of itself is not only within our charter schools, but in all schools. This is a great opportunity to look at how we can take innovation and how we can look at other opportunities to expose and entertain teaching and learning in the classroom and across our system. I'll continue to champion all of the schools that exist in Atlanta Public Schools, but I especially want us to come together to champion innovation across the system. What are your thoughts on closing schools in the community? I think that's an important question regarding school closure. I understand that there's been some history of school closures in the recent past. As a transitioning superintendent, my priority focus is listening to the community, understanding the needs of our schools and our community in collaboration with the board and with school leaders, but certainly not to come in to challenge those thoughts immediately, but to entertain support, particularly during the time of the pandemic and the balance that we'll need as we exit out. What is your position on classroom management? As a former classroom teacher, both in middle school and elementary, I think it's important to note that classroom management is critical. And I celebrate the opportunities to provide adequate, research-based, evidence-based practices for teachers to manage the classroom well. I understand that those opportunities not only allow for teachers to teach well, but for students to be able to learn. As well as that, I think it's important to look at learning through the lens of positive psychology to seek the good, but in all measures to have standard operating procedures that help empower the classroom. So I think that it's important for us all to know that championing our teachers and providing the adequate professional development helps to make a difference. What is your plan for school safety? So as I'm learning the landscape of Atlanta Public Schools and I am learning the safety culture, it's important for me to come in to take the time to assess what's in place. I look forward to learning more about the district's existing plan and how can I continue to champion that. My plan is to learn more and to ensure that it is a safe environment for all, both the students, teachers, and staff at large in schools and across the system. Will you keep the APS Police Department? I think it's incredibly important to maintain the APS Police Department. As a former supervisor in student support services who worked very closely, not just with school resource officers, but with officers tied to the school system, it is that relationship and the ability to support and champion their work that we create a very safe environment for all students. Do you consider all staff to be an essential part of a student's growth and development? As a superintendent, if I've learned anything, I've learned the importance of the role of all staff members that help impact the life of a student. Whether it's the school bus driver that serves as the very first face of the district at the start of a student's school day, and sometimes the last face when they're going home, or whether it is someone in child nutrition who ensures that they are well, or someone maintaining the cleanliness of our buildings. Every worker, every employee is essential and important to making a positive impact on our students. We also impact each other. 
And so the other reality that I have learned as a superintendent is to value all employees, to not only value them, but to reward them accordingly, and to champion and celebrate professional growth and provide opportunities when available. As a former superintendent in another district, I've also taken the time to spend a day in the life of different roles, because I realize the more you know, the more you can appreciate what every person brings to their role and to our system. So yes, everyone's essential. What are your views on school counseling programs and appropriate staffing ratios for counselors? I don't think it's a secret that this superintendent is a former school counselor. And so as a former school counselor, always a school counselor, I think that those roles are critical and essential in every school building. School counselors provide support, they provide guidance, and they also provide a heartbeat in every building. As we look at the counselor to student ratio, I'm fully aware that the American School Counselor Association has recommended roles. In the past, I've worked with the Georgia State Department to look at recommendations and policies tied to that work. I look forward to continuing championing school counselors as much as I would champion all staff. But again, as a former school counselor, I'm fortunate to have a unique reality of living that day to day. How will you show support for dual language immersion programs? I recognize that in Atlanta Public Schools, the dual language immersion programs have grown. And I think it is important to continue to champion not just their growth, but their ability to sustain. In addition to that, I think it's important to look at them through the lens of equity and see where there might be other opportunities to continue to expand in partnership with conversations with the community, as well as with the board and with school leaders. I've had a chance to also champion dual language learners in a space where we've had to advocate for not just dual language learning programs in South Carolina and other places, but to also understand that that's a powerful opportunity for scholars to not only be bilingual, but to help impact their overall achievement. Do you support increasing recess time? So I completely value recess as a former teacher and having an elementary class. I think it provides an important opportunity for students in the day-to-day -day learning model. As it relates to the opportunity to increase the time, I would welcome the chance to sit down and engage what that could look like based on the overall schedule, instructional schedule. But without question, I recognize the importance of recess for all students. What are your thoughts on increasing play-based and project-based learning in all grades? As a former teacher, I completely support project-based learning as well as play-based learning. I understand and am familiar with the impact that it has on the student and also developing social and learning skills. And an opportunity to examine what it looks like to scale it across all grades and all schools, I would invite a chance to sit down with school leaders and teachers to see the opportunities. But I do want to champion what I know it does well for students and how it creates creativity and innovation in the classroom. Do you support social and emotional learning programs? As a lifelong educator, I've had the opportunity to be trained in social emotional learning. I recognize its importance, not just in the classroom, but in the lives of our students. And in many cases, also in the lives of our teachers. Appropriate training creates a model that allows for us to ensure that our children are whole and that they are well. I've championed the onboarding of social emotional learning programs and the continuation of it, and I look forward to doing the same in Atlanta Public Schools. I think it is also important to note that as we are still experiencing a pandemic and as we look forward to coming out of it, it is the resources that are embedded in social emotional learning programs and practices that will help us support and embrace and empower our children. And it will also do the same for adults. Special thanks to all of you for the questions that you've provided. I appreciate them. They are important and they are necessary for you to know more about me. And I also look forward to more opportunities to engage questions as we will make that available to the community at large. If nothing else, I trust that the responses that I've given to you are proven as it relates to experience. And I want you to know that they are authentic. We won't have every single answer along this journey, but for where I can provide you an answer, I will. And for where I am uncertain, I will ask. 
Thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to serving you as your superintendent. I encourage and need you to be well during this pandemic. And as we come out of this time, I am excited about the chance to meet you on a more personal level. Be well.